We're going to um, split this talk up into four main sections, uh, focusing mainly on the character of Isaiah. Um, we're going to start off with a brief overview and um, an introduction. We're then going to touch on what little we know of Isaiah's family. And uh, based in chapter 6 that we've just read, we're going to look at his calling. And then finally we'll look at um, the interaction with the faithful king Hezekiah. So the book of Isaiah is made up of 66, 66 chapters. Uh, full of prophecies, history, counsel and admonition. Yet God has chosen to reveal very little about the man himself. Although there are very few specific details outlining Isaiah's character, we can find out a lot more about him through his actions and his dealings with God and the people of Israel and Judah. We're told nothing about his birth, his early life, but yet through careful reading and comparison of the scriptures, we can glean information about the character of this faithful servant of the Lord. His inspired prophecy spanned over 50 years, directing his words to Judah and Jerusalem, as it says in chapter 1 and verse 1 of Isaiah. However, he prophesied at a dark time in the history of Israel. Chapter 1, verse 4. Our sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. His time as a prophet of the Lord spanned the reigns of the four kings of Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and lastly, Hezekiah. And it's Hezekiah, of course, who revived the nation. And God magnified him in the sight of all nations, recorded in 2 Chronicles 32. However, Isaiah had to contend with deep-seated wickedness in Israel. The first chapter opens with a picture of a desperately sick man with leprous-like sores, which was a depiction of the nation. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there was no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Recorded in verse 6 of chapter 1. Yet despite this, many of Isaiah's prophecies depict wonderful things about the Jewish Messiah and are cited extensively in the New Testament apostles, concluding that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was ultimately the fulfilment of many of these prophecies. So I think... In Isaiah chapter 1, we see the scriptures showing us a, a path that the nation would take. And as we've already mentioned, the nation was likened to a sick and a leprous man. And in verse 21 to 26, um, I think we see this of chapter 1. So in verse 21, the nation is described as a harlot. And I think these few verses show us, they're written in a chiastic form, they show the nation's current state in their wicked way. And I think we see the transformation um, to, well, from what we've seen. And then we'll see that the, the city, as it's recorded in verse 21, then through to 26, is then restored. So let's just have a very brief look at um, these verses. So we see in verse 21, how is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment and righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. The silver is become dross, Thy wine mixed with water, thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fathers, neither doth they ca the cause of the widow come unto them. Things are starting to change. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. We see the link back to the dross in 22, in verse 25, And I will turn my hand upon thee, and I will purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin. And I will restore thy judges, as at the first, and thy counsellors, as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment, and her converts with righteousness. So we see in this um, structure, I think, the path of, uh, of the nation. That, that the nation had this special time to come. And 
although the nation were to have their ups and their downs, they were still instructed by Isaiah throughout the prophecy of the better days to come if they trusted and obeyed in their God, which I think is picked out in these few verses. So we're going to focus a little bit more on Isaiah, on his character. And as already mentioned, there's very little spoken um, about his character, but we are told some details about his situation and his family. And I think overall, it's clear to say, uh, see that we see a man of faith sent to a wicked nation who had turned from their God, and he was sent to turn them back to serving him. Okay, so what little details are we told about the man Isaiah? Well, he's often referred to as the son of Amos, or Amos, yet this is all we know about his father. We're introduced to one of Isaiah's sons, Shear Jashub, meaning a remnant shall return. We'll just turn to chapter 7, we'll see that. <coughs> Verse 3, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz thou and Shear Jashub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And the Lord here speaks to Isaiah, instructing him to meet Ahaz, pleading with the king to put his trust on the Lord, and to fear not, neither be faint-hearted. And chapter 8 opens with another message from the Lord to the prophet Isaiah, saying, Take thee a great roll, and write it in it with a man's pen, concerning Mahar Shalahashbaz. And we find out in verse 3 that Isaiah went in to a prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. And Isaiah here, once again, is instructed from God, and he called his son's name Mahal Shalahashbaz. And his son here is used by God as a prophetic indication that Damascus and Samaria were soon to be taken away by the king of Assyria. And I think we stop here. This is all that we know about um, Isaiah's family. Yet I think we can see clearly um, a glimpse of his character. So, verse 18 of chapter 8. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. So here we see this man, Isaiah, who faithfully acknowledges that himself and the children that God had blessed him were for a sign and were to be used in his prophetic messages, as we've already seen in chapter 8. And Isaiah faithfully responded to the call and understood that his life and his family's life was to be in service to God, to try to transform the nation from their leprous state into a nation which served the Lord. And, of course, there's no point looking at this man um, if his godly attitude doesn't have any application for us. Isaiah's faith in accepting that his family were for the Lord should make us think. Like Isaiah, we need to realise that our lives and the lives of our families are intended to be holy for God in reflecting and demonstrating his character to the world. And I think this is the first real indication we have of the man Isaiah. And it's certainly humbling to think of his, of his situation. Let's turn now to um, chapter 6. We're going to have a bit, uh, quick look at Isaiah's calling. So the bulk of Isaiah's prophetic mission was given after the events of chapter 6 where he is called to action and witness. Isaiah sees a vision in verse 1, the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And I think at first this might seem unclear to whom the vision is about, but John, under inspiration, records that the vision is a picture of Christ. Turn to um, John 12, verses 39 to 41. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their ears, their eyes, and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with they, their heart, and be converted, that I should heal them. These things said Isaiah, when he saw his glory, and spake of him. And this, the context to this verse shows the unbelief of the Jews who had seen many miracles performed by um, Jesus, but yet still would not believe him. This unbelief, although the Jews did not know, uh, fulfilled the prophecy spoken through Isaiah later on in his prophecy in chapter 53, and also in chapter 6 um, and verse 10, which reads, Make the heart of this people fat, 
and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. So, um, just very quickly, let me just read to you Isaiah 53. Um, who hath believed our report, and whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when shall we see him? There is no beauty that we should desire him. And of course this goes on to talk about um, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ and his suffering. So we see here that inadvertently the Jews through their behaviour were actually fulfilling the prophecy that was spoken of of the Lord Jesus Christ who, were they, who they were rejecting. And we can compare Isaiah chapter 6 and the book of Revelation and Revelation 4. And this strengthens the case that the vision seen uh, by Isaiah was that indeed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1 of Isaiah 6, we see um, the Lord sitting upon a throne. And we compare this to Revelation 4, verse 2. And immediately I was in, spirit, in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Verse 2 of Isaiah 6, and above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Back in Revelation 4 and verse 8, we see here, and the fourth, four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. And of course then that links to Isaiah 6 and verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So we see here this, this prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think this is picked up again um, when we see verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6. So you can turn back to Isaiah 6. And, um, and lose a revelation. And we see that this was the year that King Uzziah died. In 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16. But when he, Uzziah, was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God. And went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. So Uzziah's heart was lifted up. To his destruction, he transgressed against the Lord his God, and he burnt incense upon, upon the altar of incense. So the king tried to do the work of a priest, to offer incense to the law, to the Lord, and was punished for this act, this action with leprosy in his forehead, which, as we've already seen, is an embodiment of the nation. Isaiah, the failed king priest, died, and in the same year, Isaiah sees a vision of the Lord sitting upon a throne, and his train filled the temple. Now if we think of those um, three things, so Isaiah saw a, a vision of the Lord, so of Christ sitting upon a throne, well, what's a throne linked to? Well, that's a king. And his train filled the temple, well, what's the, what happens in the temple? Well, it's a priestly duty. So instead of being unclean like the leprous King Isaiah, this royal king, as verse 3 says, was holy, 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 as cried the seraphim. So we see here this contrast, a contrast between a king who tried to become a priest but couldn't and we see Christ as prophesied in Isaiah 6 who was um, later on could do the work of both of a king and a priest who didn't exalt himself but who was content to wait for God to exalt him as um, is recorded in Philippians and chapter 2. So I think it's in this context in chapter 6 we see that the Lord asks, Whom shall I send? in verse 8. And also, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And Isaiah's response gives us a further insight into his character and his person. But I think, firstly, his initial reaction uh, to this vision is also quite instructive. In verse 5, it reads, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, 
and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. These are the words spoken by Isaiah after he had seen the vision, recorded in the early stages of chapter 6 as we have looked at. He recognised the leprous state of the nation, which was typified by the King Uzziah, and he associated himself with that uncleanness. Isaiah was the chosen prophet of the Lord, however, despite his faithfulness, he shows tremendous humility in recognising that this message was as much for him as it was for the wayward nation. And indeed, Isaiah includes himself in the prayer that he offers up to the Lord in chapter 64 and um, verse 6. And here, again, he uses the idea of um, an unclean, leprous nation. So he very much associates himself with the people. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do fade as leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. The prophet's message to Judah and Jerusalem in Isaiah chapter 2 was, the great man humbleth himself, in verse 9. So let's turn, uh, turn back to Isaiah chapter 2. And the message uh, to Judah and Jerusalem, yeah, verse 9, and the, and the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. The lofty looks of a man shall be humbled, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, as is recorded in verse 11. So Isaiah knew here, well, Isaiah knew here that God wanted humility from the nation, and for them to accept him, to be humble and to fear him. So that's what God wanted the nation to do um, in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 9 and 11. And Isaiah recognised that. And of course there's no better way um, for a nation to learn than having a prophet from God as an example of how to live their lives. And yet, as we know, they still did not listen. Verse 9 of chapter 6, And he said, Go! And tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. And it's here where the Lord speaks, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And here we see Isaiah is prepared to associate himself with the nation's uncleanness, and is quick to respond to God's call, and to be sent to the nation to proclaim messages from the Most High. He is ready to do the will of God at every opportunity, and so should we be, striving to, as recorded in 1 Corinthians, do all to the glory of God. And this act of willingness is seen in other men of faith throughout the scriptures, notably Samuel responding to God's call in faith. And this can be seen in many other characters, but the Master shows the true example through his selfless sacrifice shown in the Garden of Gethsemane where it's recorded, not my will, but thine be done. So, doing God's will above his own was an essential element of Christ's offering, which was um, foreseen in Psalm 40, and later quoted uh, by Paul when writing to the Hebrews, Lo, I come to do thy will. And of course, like Isaiah, who was desperate to do the will of God, uh, no matter what it took, even in uh, making himself like them, um, and that is, that's a lesson for us, that it should be our desire to always delight to do uh, the will of God. So, after Isaiah shows his dedication to uh, do the will of God, he also shows his desire to see the purpose of God fulfilled, and the hearts of the nation turned back to serving their God. After receiving his call to prophetic service, he adds, Lord, how long? We see in um, verse 11 of chapter 6. And this refrain surfaces throughout the scriptures. Let's just have a brief look at um, where this is used. So first of all, turn to Psalm 74. And I think this is just, um, just to pick up uh, the importance of, of this. Psalm 74 and verse 9. We see not our signs, there is no more any prophet, neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. 
O God, how long <coughs> shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Turn over to Psalm 79, in verse 5. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Psalm 90, verse 13 records this as well. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. And I'll just read to you Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10, which reads, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And like Isaiah, we too should ask how long, whilst praying for the kingdom uh, to soon come. And it's very easy to, to read this book, but we should try to be as strong as Isaiah was. And for our love to be as strong as his was, to always do the will of God. And that should dominate our lives as it, is, as it did his. So we're starting, hopefully, to build up a picture of this faithful man from the, the very limited details that we're given of him. A man who was willing to put his life in his father's hands to do his will at all times with a humble heart. And of course, as we go through, hopefully you've seen echoes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And like all men and women of faith, the prophet Isaiah suffered, both physically and mentally. And James alludes to the prophets in his inspired letter when he addresses the scattered ecclesias. Let's just have a quick look at James in chapter 5. So, James 5 and verse 10. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. So here, uh, James alludes back to the prophets, and um, surely he's thinking of Isaiah um, when he is writing under inspiration. And back in Isaiah, we see that he shows the ultimate dedication to his God when in chapter 20, in verse 2, he is told by God, and at the same time, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 1 for connection, and in the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon the king of Assyria sent him, and fought against Ashdod and took it, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go, and lose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot, three years for a sign, and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Ethi Egyptians prisoners, and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and, and of Egypt their glory. And the inhabitant of this isle shall say in that day, Behold, such is our expectation, whether we flee for help to be delivered for, from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? So we see here, through Isaiah's actions, him typifying the time when the king of Assyria will lead away the Egyptian prisoners and the Ethiopian uh, captives. And Isaiah's commitment to his work as a prophet of God can be seen in this act of walking naked and barefoot for three years. And he's instructed to perform this sign by the Lord, and without, question, uh, without any question, he faithfully does it. And we see here why James then picks up um, speaking specifically about the prophet suffering for um, this is a huge commitment to his God. If we, think, if we stop and think about it, walking naked and barefoot for three years, just to show a sign. So you think of this man, whose, his son were born to him. They were for a sign. He's been asked to do this without question. Once more, um, diligently accepts um, God's offer to help the nation and to help the nations around him. So we're going to have a, um, a short look as we're starting to um, draw our thoughts to an end. Um, Isaiah's interactions with Hezekiah. And his interaction with Hezekiah is a, is a very moving account. And when considering these events, the spotlight is usually on the king, the main character in this record. 
and because of this there's no real elaboration on the role of Isaiah. However, for a moment, let's just think about um, Isaiah's perspective. The Lord has just slain 185,000 Assyrians overnight. The mighty Sennacherib has been forced to return and dwell in Nineveh, yet Hezekiah, the king of Judah, was sick unto death. And Isaiah comes to Hezekiah, warning him to set his house in order before his death. The king then faithfully puts his trust on the Lord and offers up a prayer, pleading with God to remember how he had walked in truth and with a perfect heart. And we're told in uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, how that the word, the word of the Lord came again to Isaiah as he was, he was gone out from speaking to Hezekiah. 2 Kings 20. And it came to pass, before, so Isaiah has just uh, spoken to Hezekiah. And it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will, send, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up to the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake, and for, and for my servant David's sake. So here God instructs Isaiah to turn back and say to the king how that God has heard his cry, and that God would add the 15 years to his life. So, after he had told Hezekiah the details of the message from the Lord, Isaiah turns, uh, cries to God in faith. In verse 11, and the prophet, and Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. So, here he's been used as a vessel to bring this message to the faithful king Hezekiah. And he had just told the king uh, what would come to pass and that he would be restored to health. Um, verse 12 of chapter 20. Um, we've got king of Babylon had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Verse 13. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things. Um, this is after um, the king had sent a present to Hezekiah. And the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armour and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto the king Hezekiah, so here he's come again, and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. So once more, Isaiah is instructed to come to Hezekiah. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons, that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? So this recounts the final stage of the life of King Hezekiah. The king of Babylon said to present to the king, and therefore he was shown all of the precious things. And it says there was nothing in his house. And 2 Chronicles 32 records that Hezekiah's heart was lifted up, which therefore prompted a visit from the prophet Isaiah, who had been instructed by God uh, to bear these words, rebuking the king for what he had done, and stating that all that Hezekiah had in his house was to be carried to Babylon. So this truly was a forthright message from God, which again was faithfully brought before the king of the ma by the man Isaiah. He appears then to never waver from conducting his duties in presenting the word of God, whether it be a news of tragedy, Hezekiah's illness, hope, his recovery, or of a future judgment on Judah's temple and the kingdom. Isaiah always brings this message as instructed. And Isaiah's prayers are not limited to the incident with Hezekiah. We have at least four prayers of Isaiah recorded. 
As already mentioned, Isaiah cries to the Lord for a sign for Hezekiah to confirm that his life will be extended. He prays with Hezekiah after Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, blasphemes against the Lord. And in Isaiah 26, Isaiah prays to the Lord, showing his dedication to serving him. With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. In chapter 3, he again offers up a prayer, asking the Lord to be gracious unto his people, going on to praise him, for he hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. The final prayer that is recorded is from chapter 63 all the way to uh, chapter 64 and verse 12. And here we see Isaiah's knowledge of the scriptures as he recounts the nation's history during the time of Moses. And we can see in this prayer how he fully understands God's character. Let's just have a quick um, look then in, at that prayer. Because we can see in verse 15 of Isaiah 63, Isaiah's understanding of God's character. Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art a father through Abraham, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledges not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is for, from everlasting. So in verse 15 he recognises his character, and in 16 he recognises or acknowledges that God was his redeemer. And of course, like Isaiah, uh, we, need, we are exhorted to put our trust and faith in God, praying at all times. Thessalonians records that we should pray without ceasing. And if we can try to as associate ourselves with the man Isaiah, who praises the Lord and shows his love for doing his work, then surely we will be seen as a faithful servant of the Lord, as Isaiah was. So, we've seen a brief insight into the man Isaiah. He's very rarely the focal point during his service to God and the nations. And I think that in itself tells us about his character. He's certainly an immensely interesting character in God's word, and he pr provides a number of lessons for believers for today. We are instructed by his example to wholeheartedly submit our lives to God in service. This may involve associating with the sinful to be examples of faith to them, like Isaiah did. It may or will involve handing our lives and our families' lives over to, the f to further God's purpose. It will involve being ready and willing to do his will as an obedient servant, always desiring to be a vessel, sanctified and useful for the master. Although the character of this man isn't God's focus, it certainly helps us to see him in his duty, wanting to always do God's will. And we think of our lives now, it appears that there is little comparison of the times of the prophet, but in some ways the time is so similar. He was sent to tell God's people a harsh, harsh message, just as we should be doing in spreading the gospel. He didn't shy away from this, instead he stood up and said that he was the man to go and admonish God's people he, from the very point we meet him, had devoted his life to God. And of course, this should be our desire. And we think of Jesus, who is spoken of so clearly in the book of Isaiah, who was the perfect example of how to devote uh, a life to God's will. And in Isaiah 35, we are given a prophecy of the time to come, of the kingdom age, when Christ will live and reign on the earth. And it must have been an amazing time for Isaiah to understand the message that he was delivering. And that's probably why we see his frustration with the people, as he could see this better time to come. And yet, all he wanted was for them to put their trust into God. And Isaiah 35 speaks of the kingdom time. And I think Isaiah's name speaks of God's estimation of him, that Yahweh has saved. And we have no doubt that he will be there in that time. So I think the, the message from looking at the character of Isaiah is, as we wait for Christ's return, let us ensure that the pattern of the man Isaiah, and of course his better Christ, becomes a template for our lives, so that, like Isaiah, a reflection of the Lord who is described as holy, 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 by God's grace will shine through.